Praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, just before we start, I just have a couple of things I would like to say. The first thing is, I just want to, in to assure everyone that the IRS, Microsoft, they never call you. If you get a call from them, don't give them your information. I'm not just making this up because I think it's some interesting news. They've been calling some of the saints, and some of them have given their information. Don't give out your personal information unless you call them. And I can assure you that the government is not calling people. If they call you, uh, then it's a scam because they will write you letters. If they want you, they'll send the sheriff out after you. But they're not going to be calling you. And I, I also want to let everyone know that um, I, I don't say everything that we're doing, but nothing is haphazard. It may seem like that. And so um, you saw Brother Delshawn lifting up the offering today. That's because that's what I want. So don't think that. Elder Pompey just kind of made that up on his own and just started calling folks. There's a reason why we don't just have everybody helping to lift up the offering. And it's not always because um, we're afraid that someone's going to steal money. That's not always it. But we don't want folks looking at envelopes trying to figure out who makes how much money or who is given money and who isn't given. We don't need all of that going on. That's how gossip gets started. So we're very selective in who we allow to handle the money for those reasons and you know sister Angie in the announcements was talking about how two hours doesn't seem long for a good movie but two hours in church seems like a long time I was just listening to my friend Bishop Rader Johnson online and he was talking about when he was in the Dominican Republic he taught a four hour Bible class I didn't tell my wife or sister honor that because I didn't want them bailing on me at the last minute. <laughs> Four hour Bible class. I'll just, maybe I might try that and just see how many of the saints is willing to stay for four hours during a Bible class. I don't know, maybe somebody might stay. <laughs> if I'm teaching for four hours, I know at least one person will be here. <laughs> That'll be the teacher. <laughs> Hey man, that was a good thing though. I, I like that. It, uh, it seems strange. It it does seem strange, the way we treat God. Hey man, we we expect a lot from God, and we expect to give a little in return for it. And so, I'm glad that the Lord is dealing with us before He comes back to get ourselves together, He's giving us a chance to get things right. If you open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, I have a couple of scriptures, one in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and one in the book of Matthew, the 10th chapter. I say one, but it's not just one verse. In Hebrews chapter 11, we'll start at verse number 13. And we'll read down through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And then in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also 
before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny, I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. And this morning I just want to speak from the subject of Is God Ashamed? This verse, this in Hebrews, the verses that we read are the tail end of something that had been discussed in the previous chapters and verses. It was leading up to this point. It, it was talking about those that died in faith, those that believed God but still never received what God had promised them. I think it's a difficult thing today, even for us, to have heard the promises of God and not receive them, to not get what he said he would give us. If you look, and you don't have to go to it, let me just read here in the 11th chapter just a few words from a couple of verses. By faith, Abel offered. By faith, Enoch was translated. By faith, Noah was warned. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out, he went. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength. These scriptures, these are talking about the people that he is referring to here in the 11th where it says these all died in faith. They, they believed God. Abraham died before he even saw the promise of God. I know some people believe the promise was that he would have a son, but that's not the promise. The promise was that he would become a mighty nation that God would bless his seed as the sand of the sea and as the stars of heaven for number. Abraham died not having received that promise, but he still believed God. These are people whose faith and confidence in God was so strong that even though they didn't get what God was offering them, they still trusted God. He uses some words here they were that, about us in reference to them. You know, this, the, uh, in chapter 12 and verse 1 it says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. It's talking about the fact that we have had examples that have come before us of how to serve God the correct way. It's not just a matter of I've read the Bible and I'm doing it. Because the Bible tells us that we are living epistles read and known of men People read our lives before they'll read their Bible. People will watch what you do before they'll listen to a preacher. So it is the way we live that is the example to others. And in the book of Hebrews, he's referring to those that came before the Holy Ghost. They didn't receive the promise of the Spirit of God in their life. And yet, they still hung on to what was right. I know there are some in there like Noah, Sarah. You might say, well, they received the promise, but they didn't because they weren't looking for an earthly promise. They were looking for the heavenly. They were looking for a country that was whose builder and maker was God. So they may have received something natural here, but that wasn't the full promise that they were looking for. They were looking for God to take them to heaven, and they died in faith without ever having received the promise of the Spirit of God or getting to heaven. They just trusted God knew what he was talking about. He goes on and he says, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek 
a country. And in the very next verse, it says, if they truly had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. The, the, the issue then, what the author is writing about here is the fact that you can have confidence in God, but if your mind is still where God brought you from, you will have an opportunity to go back. Uh, let me let me say it this way. When you get on the road and you're driving from Michigan to California, there is a point of no return. There's a point where you say, I'm not going back now. We too close. I've done that before where we've been in some really bad weather driving from Indianapolis to Michigan. And the weather was so bad that my wife said, we need to turn around and go back. I said, no, nah, we too close now. Uh, it'll take us longer to get back home than it does to just keep on going. I was scared because I thought we was going to be stuck out on the highway somewhere, but I knew turning around wasn't the right answer. My mind was on getting where we were going. And I couldn't let her fear make my fear overtake me. I kept on pushing. This is what he's talking about. There's a, there's a point in our journey with God where we have to say, I've given up everything behind me and I'm not going back to it. I'm too committed now to this thing. I'm not turning around and heading back. But the reason why people turn back, he gives us the answer here. They were mindful. They were desiring those things that they left. That's our job. That's what we spend our lives doing is trying to get ourselves to not want the things that God brought us out of. Now, I'm saying it that way because I want people to understand that when you get the Holy Ghost, that doesn't mean that you lost your flesh. Your flesh will always want to do wrong things. But we can continuously fight our flesh. That's why the Apostle Paul said before he died, I fought a good fight. We are fighting this flesh. Because my flesh wants to go do wrong. Let me, let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about. I've never drank alcohol. I, I've never done that. Now, there were many things that my father allowed us to do, but drinking was not one of them that he would permit us to do. Not, not his older children. I think he let the younger ones drink, but he wouldn't let us. Drinking and smoking cigarettes was, was banned. But there are times when I drive by and I see a billboard with a bottle of some kind of alcohol and it got the sweat drops on it just right looking you know and it looks cold and refreshing and my flesh will say you know that's got to taste good <laughs> now if you wasn't saved you could go get some of that I never had it but my flesh wants it I can only imagine the fight that people have when their flesh wants it and they know the results of it. We fight. We struggle. We give our best to not disappoint God. It is a fight that we have. And the reason why is because we don't want to be mindful. We don't want to be longing after the things that God brought us out of. I don't want to go back into the sin that God brought me out of. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't want to sin. I don't want to go back to that life because I know the results of that kind of life and what it'll lead to. And so he says, those people that came before, the reason why they were so committed to God was because they forgot about where they came from. They had made up their mind, I'm not going back to the way I was before I got saved. 
Doesn't mean that they didn't have doubts in their mind. Abraham, when God told him that he was going to have a son, Sarah laughed and Abraham doubted. Now the Bible says, let me take that back. The Bible says that Abraham didn't doubt. Sarah laughed though. But Abraham was wondering. He, he wasn't sure how God was going to bring this thing about. So when Sarah offered him her concubine, brother took the offer. Amen. Now I just want y'all to know one thing right now. If my wife does that, my answer is no. My first question would be, how did you get a concubine? <laughs> I'll leave that alone for another Bible class. These people sought after God. They were not ashamed of God. And Jesus brings this same point up. If you are willing to confess me, before men, before those that you are around, if you're willing to live the kind of life that I'm asking for, I won't be the kind of God that will deny you before God. I won't, I won't be the kind of person that turns my back on you. I won't pretend like I don't know who you are. You just keep on fighting for me. He's not talking about going around and trying to persuade everybody to get saved. He's talking about living a life that is right. That is your confession. That is your witness. Your witness is to make sure that people see how you are living and that it is right for God. When, when the company that I used to work for, when they would have Christmas parties, they would have everybody sign a, a paper saying that if you drink, you won't hold them accountable if you go out and drive and have an accident. And they told that the human resources manager came and brought me the paper and I said, I'm not signing it. Well, everybody has to sign it. I said, I'm not signing it. And I handed it back to her and she said, no, you got to sign it. I said, I just won't come to the dinner. I'm not signing anything that would imply that I'm going to do wrong. There's a question. If I sign that, well, maybe he did drink. If he wasn't, why did he sign that? I didn't want that on me. I didn't want her or anybody else in the company to say, well, he signed it. I didn't know what they might think. All I knew was, I know I'm not going to drink, so I'm not going to sign it. And if, if it comes down to it, I said, I'll just you dismiss myself, punch out and go on home. Oh, no, you don't have to do that. And I said, well, if the, the situation is either I sign or I can't be here, then I just won't be here. She picked the paper up and went on out. She was mad. She took the paper and left. Now, I wasn't being ugly about it, but I knew how gossip spreads. And I didn't want anybody saying, oh, I saw him drinking out of one of them red cups. I don't know what was in there because I didn't sign no papers. It was fruit punch. <laughs> Actually, I don't think I ever drank out of one of those cups. I just drank bottles of water. That was it. I left that even alone because I didn't want nobody thinking anything. Right. Now, I'm not saying it's a sin. I'm just saying I'm trying to protect my reputation. I want people to know I'm saved. I want people to know that I'm trying to do right. And I'm not going to beat anybody up. But when they brought it to me, I took a stand. I'm not going to do this because I feel like this implies something wrong. So Jesus is saying, stand for what is right. And I won't forget you. Stand for what is truth. And I won't let you down. He goes on in, in Hebrews, he talks about being persuaded. Are we persuaded by the lives of those that came before us? Not just those in the Old Testament. But are we persuaded by the life of those in the New Testament? Are we persuaded by the lives of those that we see that are living holy? Does it move us to make us want to do right? The reason why this is asked here is because there are some people who get angry when they see you do right. They won't say, I want to do better. They say, oh, look at them. They think they're holier than thou. They think they're more saved than anybody else. You know why? Because they're not persuaded 
by your life of holiness. Some people don't care that you want to live right. I'm saying that because I don't want us to think that just because I'm trying to live right, that means everybody's going to be on my side. They're going to defend me. No, they're not. There are some people who are not persuaded because of your life. But if you want to be right with God, we must be persuaded by those that came before us. Why? Because they were willing to hold on to God no matter what happened. They were willing to hold on to God even when they didn't receive the promise. I love this scripture in the book of Job where he felt like God was destroying him. And he said, though he slay me, even though God is killing me, yet I will put my trust in him. We have to be persuaded that no matter what the situation is, God still has not turned his back on me. I might not understand it. I might not see where God is coming from. I might not know the plan that God has, but I still trust that God is doing right in my life. Are we embracing, he said, and we're persuaded of them and embrace them? Are we embracing the truth or are we hiding from it? Now, let me just say it like this. To embrace them means that we stand up for and support them that are doing right. And some of us have a problem with that. And I'm not talking about just Christ temple. I'm talking about some folks that are saved, some folks that are sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost got a problem with other folks that's living right we won't embrace them we're embarrassed by them because they stand up for what is right and we'll just kind of ease away a little bit well you know you, know, you just I, I, I don't speak for them we'll say things like that when people question us about someone that goes to your church well I don't speak for them because we're ashamed because they live in right I'm not talking about when someone does wrong. I'm talking about when people are doing right. I've had people try that on me. What do you think about so-and-so? I think they're great. I know they're living right. I believe they're doing everything they can to live right. I don't have a problem with them. I've had them come to me about folks that I didn't think was living right. What do you think about so-and-so? What do you think about them? I think they come to church. Are you? Usually that stops the conversation. You're not going to get me to badmouth God's people. I don't care if they're not living right. I'm trying to help them get right. I'm not going to sit around and tear somebody down. I'm embracing God's people. Even when they don't come, I'm still embracing them. Come on, y'all. Listen, let me, let me say it like this. It doesn't make you less saved to stand up for God's people. It doesn't make you less saved to not gossip about those that are not living right. Do you believe that we're just strangers and pilgrims? He talked about this in verse 13. They, 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 they confessed I'm, I'm a stranger and a pilgrim. This isn't even my country. This isn't my home. Some folks got their minds so wrapped up on the world that they can't even see heaven no more. They can't see the goal that we have in mind because all they're worried about is their job, their family, their friends. All they're worried about is everything going on in this life and not even worried about the world to come. The only way we're going to make it is if we understand we're just strangers. Let me let me let me use an example. My wife and I went to the Ukraine in November. I didn't get involved in what was going on over there. I wasn't bothering with the politics. I wasn't trying to figure out what was going on in the news. You know why? I was a stranger. I was just a pilgrim. I was over there visiting. And then I come back home. And when I got home, I didn't turn my news on to see what's going on in this country. I wasn't worried about what the politicians are doing. I heard somebody say, uh, uh, Elder Pompey, just before prayer, you know, pray for the president. He's our president. Yes, he's our president. I'm praying for him because I don't want him to come up with laws that say that I can't serve God. I'm praying for him to make things easy for me to keep worshiping God. 
I don't care about the politics. I don't care about what he says or tweets or anything like that. It don't matter to me. I, I, I don't even know what he's tweeting anymore. It doesn't matter. You know why? Because I'm a stranger here. This isn't what I'm looking for. I'm not trying to make America great again. I'm trying to get to heaven. We are strangers just passing through. This is what he means when he said they embraced the truth. They held on to the truth and realized that this earth is not their home. Sometimes we get aches and pains in our bodies. They break down on us. Amen. Maybe that's just a, a little reminder that this ain't your home. No, don't get too comfortable in this body because this ain't the body that you're going to always have. Just a little nudge to say, yes, you just keep on looking for that other country. You just keep on being a pilgrim. I know your arm is hurting right now, but don't you worry about that. That's just to remind you that this ain't your home. And you just keep on serving me. Sometime it takes that to get us to straighten up and act right. And if that's what it takes for me, that's what I want. Now, y'all hear me saying that? I mean it. If that's what it takes for me to serve God and do right and make it to heaven, I want it. I don't care what it is. I don't want to go to hell over any reason. I'd hate to end up in the lake. And the Lord say, well, if you'd have just let me afflict your elbow... You'd have made it. I don't want that. Now, I'm being a little silly with that, but y'all understand what I'm saying. I don't care what it takes. I want to make it to heaven. I understand. I'm just a pilgrim here. I'm just a sojourner through this world. This is not my home. This is not what I feel comfortable in. The world is off balance. Something is wrong. And I'm glad that God allowed me to see that. Something is not right here. And I don't want it to be where I'm trying to make it right. I want to make it to heaven. If we're going to make it out of here, we've got to look for that country. That's where our focus has got to be. You know, the question comes to my mind, are we still looking for this kind of lifestyle? Or are we trying to make it to heaven? Because if we're going to make it to heaven, we've got to live God's lifestyle. His life is holy. That's it. There's no two sides of it. There's no holy sometimes and holy when you feel like it and ho not holy when you don't feel like it. If we're going to be saved, we got to be holy people. The Bible says, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. You're not getting there unholy. You're not getting there sometime holy. You're not getting there partially holy. You're going to be holy or you're not going to make it. Here, let me just give you another scripture. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That's Bible. You're not getting to heaven and you're not living holy. All right, I'll, I'll leave it alone. I ain't getting no amens on it. You know, let me just say, let me go to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35. He says this. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. How long is it going to take? I don't know. Just be patient. How long should I have confidence in God? Don't throw it away. Cast not away your confidence. You keep on trusting in God. Now, the reason why I brought the subject up is God ashamed because in verse 16 it says, but now. The word but means I'm going to show you the other side. But now they desire a better country. So we've got some folks that aren't looking to heaven. They're not looking to get to heaven or they may want it, but they're still looking at the earth as their home. He said, but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Where a uh, Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Is, my question is, God ashamed to be called your God? We have in the book of Romans where the apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Yes. Amen. That's fine. But is God ashamed of you? 
We always want to put it on us and act like, well, God is so loving, it doesn't matter how I act because God's love is unconditional. Don't be deceived. Now, this is what the Bible says. Don't be deceived. We've been going in Bible class in the book of Revelations, chapter 3, about the lukewarm church. He said, I'll spit you out. I'll spew you out. I brought this up. He's a lamb right now. He's the lamb of God. Lambs are very sensitive and, and gentle creatures. But when God raptures the church out of here, he's going to become the lion of the tribe of Judah. And a lion destroys. You might be yelling and claiming and screaming and hollering. God's love is unconditional. But you wait until you face that lion. You'll know something. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be around to see the wrath of God. I want to know that God is not ashamed of me. I don't want God to look down and say, oh, it's him. Mm. You know why? Because I want to confess him before men. I'm going to keep on living right. Keep on living safe. Y'all getting this? Amen. I, 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 just, I just want to make sure that we understand when we walk out that we're asking ourselves, is God ashamed of me or is God pleased with me? Is God displeased with me or is God proud of me? I want him to be pleased with my life. Is God ashamed? That's up to us. As each individual, it's up to us to determine whether God is ashamed of me or not. But I want him for me, as for me and my house. I can't speak for my wife. Can't speak for my children. Can't speak for my friends or anybody else. As for me and my house. This house that I'm in, we're going to serve the Lord. Come on, Elder Poppy.